My name is Julie Ann Link and welcome to the Music Link. This week on the Let's Link Project, I'd like to welcome the Toledo Symphony Orchestra Principal Bassoonist Casey Zell. Thank you so much for being here, Casey. Hi, thanks for having me, Julie. For everyone watching, Casey and I met in New Zealand about 10 years ago. Casey, please share an overview of who you are and what you do as a professional musician. Yeah, so I am principal bassoon of the Toledo Symphony Orchestra. We're a full-time orchestra uh, with some of our extended chorus part-time. And so we're one of the largest regional orchestras in the U.S. And I also am on the music faculty of the University of Toledo, and I'm on the faculty of the Toledo Mindfulness Institute. Tell me about where you grew up and do you ever visit? Oh yeah, I still visit. <laughs> uh, my, my mom would be mad if I didn't visit. No. Um, yeah, I grew up in North Carolina and um, I was really lucky to grow up where I did. The next town over from me had Mark Popkin, who is one of the great bassoon teachers, but he was one of the great teachers of beginners. Um, so you don't always see him on people's bios because a lot of times he was like our middle school or our high school teacher. So there's a lot of his, uh, what we call pop kids in, in the US. Um, you know, there's all these random good bassoon players from North Carolina. I think um, Lori White in Utah Symphony, Tom Fleming in Dallas Symphony. Um, I think Rebecca Heller in Ice maybe is from Mark. Um, anyway, there's, there's tons of us out there. So I was really lucky to grow up there. And uh, I also got to go to the North Carolina School of the Arts for high school, which is the only publicly funded arts conservatory in the US. And they have a residential high school program. And that was really where I got my start. Wow, so is that where you got introduced to music? Um, I started music in the second grade. <laughs> we had a school carnival. And there was a raffle for free piano lessons, and I won. <laughs> so I won two months of free piano lessons at the piano store in the mall. And that was where I started with my teacher, Charmaine, and she was great. And we had little recitals in the middle of the mall. Um, so I was really lucky uh, to start music that way. Of course, as an adult looking back, I realized probably maybe not as many kids entered the free piano lessons <laughs> raffle as maybe <laughs> the one for candy, but uh, it worked out for me. <clears throat> Do any of your family members uh, have a musical background? Um, not my immediate family. Um, Classical music was definitely my thing growing up. Although um, these days my brother does play bluegrass guitar. And um, I hear that my great aunt, um, I was only a, a little, little kid when she was uh, very elderly. In the twenties, she played piano on the radio, which was actually kind of, she was kind of a radical woman playing piano on the radio, you know, instead of a man. Um, uh, but no, I kind of came into music on my own. Did you always want to go into music? Um, I think, yeah, I think by the time um, I was in high school, I wanted to do something musical, although I looked at a lot of different options. I looked at being a band director and that kind of thing. Um, once I was in high school with my high school teacher, I was really able to see that with working hard and with working with him that I could go to conservatory for college. Uh, so I was really lucky and that was what I did. Mm. Where did you go to college and what was the music program like? I went to the Eastman School of Music. So that's a music only school. It's about 500 undergrads and um, it's in Rochester, New York and there's a lot of snow. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you wake up in the morning and it's dark and you go to the practice room and you practice all day and then it's dark and you come home and you do it all again the next day. No, Eastman was amazing. I had a lot of amazing teachers. Um, my teacher, John Hunt, was excellent and very caring and um, Chen Quan Lin really helped my trio. We went to, we won an award at Fish Off. Um, chamber music competition, and we won some grants. Um, I got to play in the Balinese Gamelan, 
which was really awesome and I loved that. And uh, which is like a percussion orchestra from Indonesia. And um, I got to learn Baroque style with Paul Odette. I mean, there's so many amazing colleagues and teachers there um, that I was really lucky to go there and um, yeah, just worked hard. <laughs> Did you ever consider changing careers? Um, yes and no. I think I'm really lucky in that I got my first professional gig when I was in my undergrad. That was with principal with Toledo Opera. I'm not Toledo. <laughs> Tulsa. Uh, Toledo was surprised here. Tulsa Opera. Um, and then, which I played through my grad, grad years. And then when I was still in grad school, that was when I won my, um, I had a fixed term contract with the Auckland Philharmonia. So I didn't have that period of right after school where kids go, oh no, you know, I have no safety net, what now? Um, that's a, you know, music's a tough industry. I've had hard years for sure. Um, I, you know, there's been some years where when I was a freelancer, I had a part-time job, including like teaching yoga and stuff. Um, and then I, um, I fell off my motorcycle in New Zealand one year, actually a guy rammed me. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I was injured. So I actually worked as an accountant for um, PQ Blackwell, which is now Blackwell and Ruth in New Zealand. They're an art book publishing house. And actually, I really loved that job. That was an awesome job. I had an amazing boss who taught me lots of stuff. And, um, you know, we, I got to wear like fancy suits to work and we had like a <laughs> fancy Italian espresso maker and all that stuff. So actually, that was a really cool job, too. I love that just as many as much as a lot of music jobs that I've had also. Mm. Could you share more about your accounting job and like any skills that um, transfer, you know, um, that you took from music? Yeah, I mean, I think the reason why they gave me that job, I was already doing a lot of the paperwork for the New Zealand Double Read Society, which I set up with the oboe teacher, Alison Jepson. Um, so I had a lot of those kind of basic skills, also from being a freelancer and a contractor. If you're, uh, one thing I will say, uh, especially when you start out when you're teaching or when you're freelancing, you do need to be a good and faithful accountant or you will run out of money. <laughs> um, so I, I had a lot of the basic skills, um, luckily, which allowed me to apply for that job at PQ Blackwell. Um, mm -hmm. But I learned a lot more about accounting. I learned a lot about, um, we did a lot of sales forecasting. You know, I think a lot of times people think accounting is about just reporting what you used to do and like tracking receipts. And that's important, like especially at the bottom level. And of course that always happens. But um, once you're talking about working with the CFO and really being valuable to the business, you're actually working in forecasting, you're working with the marketing department and you're looking ahead. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and in music too, you have to look ahead. Where are you going next? Um, mm -hmm. Rather than uh, chewing the cud. So I think, yeah, I learned a lot of great stuff there and um, I'm super good with Excel, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me more about your music teachers and how they influence um, your philosophies now. Oh gosh, you know, <laughs> I've been really lucky with the teachers that I've had. Um, in Zen, there is a saying, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And um, they believe that like the right teacher for you will appear. Um, that's definitely been true for me. I've been really lucky with that. Um, Mark Popkin, my first teacher, he's great with beginners, I think I said. Um, John Hunt, uh, my undergrad teacher, has a really beautiful way of, of playing and phrasing with a beautiful sound. And that was really important for my undergrad foundation. And um, my grad school teacher, Will Roberts, um, you know, I got to go hear the Dallas Symphony play every week. He has this awesome, amazing sound. And uh, he really helped me understand orchestral music, how to really play it, how it's supposed to go, how to fit in the orchestra, all those orchestra skills, all those skills that help you win an audition. Mm. Um, so he really helped me um, get my first gigs. And um, 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, all my teachers were amazing. And um, uh, Roger and I in the New York Phil, mm -hmm. uh, he really helped me a lot with uh, reads. And it was kind of interesting studying with him. I went back to study with him for mm, like a few months uh, when I came back from New Zealand. So I had already been working, had had a career for quite a while. So it was nice to check in with someone, but he's an unbelievable read maker. Yeah. And, um, you know, he really believed in me when I was setting up my career here again. Um, and so I was able to get a job uh, right away, luckily. So I, yeah, I've been really grateful for all of them. Wow. What have you learned about the music industry since graduating? You know, I, I can't say that the music industry is hard because everybody told me that, <laughs> like even in high school when I was like playing in all these youth orchestras and community bands and jazz band and all this stuff, um, I was told that. So that was not a surprise, but I want to get that out there for, for students for sure. You know, but the, the flip side of that is um, there's a lot of amazing people in the music industry too. I think we've all worked super hard for this and we all love music and we all know that we are the torchbearers that are bringing this music forward. So there's a lot of ama amazing people and um, people are really willing to help. You know, if you wanna play through your audition stuff or you want some advice for something like, people are really giving with that because they've had that for themselves and in their own careers. And um, so I think we're really lucky in a way, you know, I think as we all know, it's not one of those um, jobs that at 5 p.m. you shut your laptop and you're done. And uh, there's good and bad elements to that. <laughs> but I think that's one of the good things about it too. Hmm. Could you share a bit more about your teaching career? Yeah, I've always had a teaching career on the side too. I think I started teaching in my undergrad and uh, it's really important when you're first starting out to learn how to teach students. And I think one of the biggest um, things that I learned during grad school was the idea of chunking. So you're breaking everything down into small pieces and you're looking only for a repeatable success before you're moving that student forward. Uh, and to be really efficient. So less talking, you do direct feedback for what you want and you get it done and then the next thing and then you build it. Um, I really learned that um, at SMU uh, with Dr. Sa Sarah Allen. Um, and one thing that we did was uh, we made videotapes of our teaching that we then re-watched, which is really good too because you'll realize, oh, I rambled there, or I said that, or I tried to make this analogy and that kid clearly didn't get it. And it takes some time with teaching to figure out how to teach for different students. Like the way that you learned is not necessarily how your student is gonna learn. And you'll notice that different things work for different students. Um, sometimes that's called skillful means, right? You have to have the means to figure out what's skillful with that student and with this student, and it might be different. Um, now I teach at the University of Toledo, so um, we mostly teach undergrads um, and we mostly have non-majors, although there are music majors there too, and um, I do have quite a few um, post-grads or freelancers that come to play for me for a lesson, so I do a lot of like audition excerpt coaching um, for that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, those are also, I require everybody to audition for me for our sub list and I redo our sub list every year. I actually try to do it really fairly because mm -hmm. we have a lot of really great schools around here. We have Overland, University of Michigan, um, Bowling Green, we have Cleveland Institute. So actually there's a lot of really great students here <laughs> who can sub, plus there's really good freelancers here too, because actually up in Michigan, there are quite a lot of um, good little gig orchestras. So, um, you know, I'm helping, and, and those people, I'm not always teaching them. I always, you know, that depends on what they want. But um, yeah, so, and I have adult students too. So I have really a very full range of beginners to people that are working who come to play for me. Hmm. Casey, you mentioned the New Zealand Double Read Society and founding that with oboist Allison Jepson. Could you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, <laughs> that was an awesome project. And um, 
you know, I, so I was freelancing in New Zealand at this point. I did have a lot of contracts with APO and NZSO. Um, and I was looking for something else to do. And um, I went over to Australia to, I entered the Queensland Double Reed Society competition and also the national one, the Australasian Double Reed Society competition. And um, no one had heard of me, right? Cause I had like just moved to New Zealand and um, I won first prize overall in both of them. And everybody was like, who is this person <laughs> who came and took our money, right? Um, <laughs> so that was really great. I got to uh, make friends over there with some really great people, including um, Celia Craig was running ADRS at the time. And um, Eve Newsom, who does a lot of work with Flow, she's a great oboist over there too. I'm not sure who's running it now, I, ADRS these days, but um, they actually have quite a big organization with a lot of different branches. Mm. And, uh, they had always want to have, wanted to have a New Zealand branch. Um, and they said, you know, I think Alison Jepson would be interested in doing it in New Zealand too, but she didn't want to have to do all the work, right? Because it's actually a huge amount of work. <laughs> so um, they kind of hooked me up with Alison in New Zealand and um, I was living in Auckland, so was she at the time. And we had really good complementary skill sets. She had been teaching there. She has an amazing teaching career that she's had, and she had a lot of students. And um, she already knew a lot of the band directors and orchestra directors in the schools there. And I had had the, um, you know, some good accounting and freelancing experience, and I had the time to work on stuff. Um, so it actually worked out really, really well. We ran a couple of really big international conferences with a bunch of people and we brought a bunch of people in to play chamber music and teach master classes and um, we did regular chamber music club. We had tapas nights where we would talk about um, the orchestra like APO music before they played it where we would all go out to eat and then we go to the concert together. And, um, and the New Zealand Double Reed Society is still uh, well, Julie might update me, but as far as I'm aware, it's still up and running and doing good things. And um, that for me is a really something I'm proud of, like that we built something that was stable enough and important enough to enough people. We built an awesome container that other people have picked it up and kept it going. And uh, I think that shows that it was a really valuable asset. Absolutely. Such a wonderful community. And two, honestly, Casey, it sounds so inspiring where I'm like, I want to get that going in Christchurch and have, um, <laughs> you know, a nice little bassoon community. So it's nice to hear more about that. Tell me about your chamber music career. Um, I never did it like just as my only thing, but, um, you know, I've done a bunch of stuff. I worked as a um, animator, um, like a storytelling, we had, we won a grant to do storytelling with wind quintet in schools. Um, and that was in New York state. Um, I did, I had, a, yeah, we had a great, um, oboe piano bassoon trio in college. And we did a lot of touring again, kind of New York state. We, we, um, we didn't win overall at fish off, but we won like one of the lower level prizes. Um, and um, in grad school, yeah, we did chamber music too. I think um, in New Zealand, I had a really great uh, trio with a flute player and a clarinet player. And uh, we commissioned a bunch of stuff with sounds and we won a uh, Wallace Trust Fund grant uh, for that too. And uh, we did a bunch of fundraiser concerts for like the Auckland City Mission and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I also used to play in like, um, like an electronic music group. I actually, well, I played in Vitamin S. Kiwis will know what that is. It's um, it's pure, it's pure improv. Um, a lot of like noise improv, um, and those are people from that play all kinds of music and very few classical musicians. So, I really loved that because that was a different way of connecting with the bassoon and just trying stuff out and making noises and whatever. But I met some really great artists doing that. Um, so I worked with um, Paul Smith, who he works under the name Reverbafon. Um, he's done a lot of great electronic music. And um, Jill Vinson, who's a great guitar teacher and a player in, in New Zealand too. And um, so we had like a like an improv noise band thing that was a lot of fun. And um, Reverberfan did like amazing video art, 
with it too. So we would project the art and then and then play live with it. Um, so that was really a lot of fun and that was something totally unexpected. Um, yeah, I mean, nowadays we, we have a chamber series with Toledo Symphony where basically, if you wanna play a piece, we'll put it on a concert, which is really lucky actually as an orchestra musician, that's kind of a rare thing that we don't get a lot. Like last year, I got to play the Francais divertissement for bassoon and strings, and that was a lot of fun. And um, so we actually get to play whatever cool chamber music we would like, which is really cool. And um, yeah, I mean, I think chamber music is really great. That's where like as a student, you really learn to play with different instruments. How do you play with a bow? How do you play with a clarinet reed, you know, um, and make it all one where there, you know, there's fewer points to have to pay attention to. So it's definitely a super important skill and it's a lot of fun. Wow. Yeah. And it sounds amazing. Wow. <laughs> um, what was it like kind of going into that new improv like um, environment and getting used to the electronic sounds? And I'm thinking of just like with Baroque playing too, where in some ways you get to kind of, um, you know, do some impro improvisation and um, would love to hear more about that transition. And yeah, I mean, I was freelancing at the time, um, but full time, um, so quite busy, which I was really lucky for. Um, but I was looking to like just, you know, keep my horizons open and keep looking for new things with music. You do have to be willing to like have it be a fail, right? You're gonna just like go on stage in front of a bunch of people and make weird noises with your. <laughs> Um, and it, Kiwis, I don't know if you remember the St. Kevin's Arcade, I think they've torn it down. Is that, is that right? No, it's still there? Okay. They were talking, it used to be on K Road, and um, it was this really old building with like QC shops in it, and you went down the stairs, and like in the back, and it was all sketchy and graffiti, and then you would go down in the dark, and there was a rat skeller bar down there, called the wine cellar and um then to get to the vitamin s room you had to like walk through like all these weird dark hallways and then it was like in the back but one of the nice things about that was like they just had their own room there was all these like broken pianos and like weird instruments in there and people had brought all kinds of weird percussion instruments and all sorts of stuff um but actually that's a really um vitamin s is a really long running group in New Zealand like I think they've been doing it for like 30 years wow. so there are some like really seriously good people um there's some really good Kiwi musicians in there and they record it so you can listen back and decide what was successful or or what was not and um yeah it's good to give yourself like that space of just trying stuff out because um you know in the orchestra you're not gonna like go to rehearsal and try stuff out, right? <laughs> you know, it really has to be how it has to be. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was a really cool experience. I would definitely recommend it. I mean, you know, sometimes when I have students that have trouble with rhythm or stuff um, like that, I'll recommend them go down to the drum circle, you know, like figure it out in a different way, away from your bassoon or out of this context, you mm. know, and um, it can really work. Wow. Could you tell more about your orchestra career? Yeah, I mean, we, um, we work 40 weeks in Toledo Symphony, which is full time for most American orchestras. So we, um, in theory, we could work six days a week, 40 weeks a year. And we do work six days a week for quite a few months of the year, but we have, we have Mondays off. Um, so then Tuesday, the Thursday is usually rehearsals. Um, then Friday, Saturday is concerts. And then Sunday is usually new music rehearsal concert. Um, but that said, we do all kinds of different concerts. So, um, we do two weeks a month that are what masterworks, right? So like your standard orchestra stuff. And it usually, um, one of those will be slightly bigger and one will be slightly smaller. So one would be Mahler and the other week would be Mozart, right? For example. Um, then we also do um, 
we do all, oh my gosh, we do all kinds of stuff. So we, <laughs> we have educational concerts where the kids come to our hall. That's still full orchestra. We do uh, a full pop series. And then in addition to the pop series, we also have like a special event series. That's stuff like um, last year and that we had Ben Folds come. We have had Queen Lativa, Audra McDonald, Bernadette Peters, like those kind of people, like big people, uh, Chris and Chenoweth, um, oh, the Hamilton guy. Who's the Hamilton guy? <laughs> I forget. Oh my gosh. Sorry, people, Hamilton people. Anyway, he was amazing, actually. Um, we do that. And um, we also have small groups. So um, we have a full chamber series, which is like a uh, formal in um, a fancy, what we have called the Toledo Club. It's like an old fancy club from the 1800s. But we also have chamber music groups that go out. So like I'm in a wind quintet and we go out into the community and that's for nursing homes and schools and stuff. Brass quintet, string, quint string quartet, um, they do that. Um, we do, oh gosh, just, oh, we're also, we are unified with the ballet. So we are the ballet orchestra. We do probably three or four ballets a year, including the Nutcracker, which is obviously the big one <laughs> in the U.S. That's like the requirement. And, uh, we play for the opera. So, um, it's, it's kind of a cool job in that we have a lot of variety. Mm -hmm. Um, so because of that, um, I was going to go on a read tangent, but anyway, so yeah, we have a lot of variety, which is great. And, and I teach a little bit. Um, there's not a lot of good school instruments in Toledo, unfortunately. So um, I don't have like legions of students. Like uh, when I was in Dallas, you could have mm -hmm. as many students as you could possibly teach. I think one year I had 30 or 40 wow. um, when I was finishing grad school. Here, I've usually got, you know, between five to 10 students, which honestly, with being that busy in the orchestra is actually plenty, especially because mm -hmm. I usually make them reads. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, a lot, a, a lot of variety, which is great. Mm. Casey, how do you balance all of that? <laughs> well, um, well, this year is COVID, so <laughs> we're not doing almost anything. Um, you know, I think um, one thing that I've done is I use gouge shape profiled cane now. I do not fuss over reeds. If it's a soft piece, I don't try to salvage it. I throw it out. Um, and I make all my blanks over the summer. So they're, they sit and then I can just clip the tip and use, and use them when I, when I need. Of course, I still spend a lot of time making reads, but I spend a lot less time making reads. And I really do try to encourage my students to start making reads as soon as they're able to get the tools. Um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, some months are busier than others. For us, December is like an insanely busy month. Um, I think starting the day after Thanksgiving all the way until Christmas, we have 35 concerts. That's not counting rehearsals or anything. And usually my quintet does one or two. Um, so like that month, we don't do a lot of, there's not a lot of balance that month. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, um, sometimes we might have, have weeks where we're not that busy and we do have days off. So it is hard like having friends that are not musicians because pretty much Thursday, Friday, Saturday night and Sunday afternoon is working. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I have a lot of time during the day to myself. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on how hard the music is that we're working on. And I usually try to at least um, look at everything and get an idea about all the music over the summer, especially if I haven't played it before. Um, I used to play assistant, which was mostly second. And so when I moved here, even stuff I'd played before, I was principal now. <laughs> so I had to learn, had to learn a new part and, and that kind of thing. But, um, over the years, you know, stuff repeats and it, it does get easier. Like once you're tenured and you're kind of settled in, um, but yeah, it depends, it depends on the month. <laughs> Could you share more about your read making style and techniques? Yeah, um, my read making style is an amalgamation of different stuff from different teachers. 
I mean, even my read wrapping is from like my very, very first teacher. Um, I use the shrink wrap because it's fast and it doesn't mold. Anyway, that's minor. Um, honestly, reads really depend on the job, I think. Um, you know, when I was playing mostly second and um, to a principal who played very um, covered, you know, dark, like cologne radio fill kind of style. Uh, I played on the Rieger 2 shape, which is a really big shape, and I was trying to play down, and I, I made reads specifically for that. Um, now that I'm the principal, and the principal in a different country with a different style and in a different hall, I play a very different kind of a read. Um, I need a louder read. Oh, first of all, we have kind of like we sit in kind of a weird dead spot in our hall, which is very nice, but it's just where we sit. And a lot of stages have that. Um, and I'm playing a smaller shape now. Um, it's basically a Rieger 1A shape. And um, yeah, I mean, I think Roger and I really helped me get really good at finishing reads, making sure everything is really um, finished and smooth and even and graded very well. Mm -hmm. um, I do Hertzberg beveling now, which I also learned from Roger, which I think helps evenness over the full range. Mm -hmm. and. Before that, I was making basically Eastman reads, Van Hoosen reads, so um, that was a new thing to me that I added later, more recently. Um, it's a lot more work, but uh, when I gave it a try, they were clearly so much better that I was like, okay, I have to do this now. Okay, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's as many ways to make reads as there are people, you know, it's, you just got to play what works, I think. You know, even if I was to swap reeds and bassoons with my second player, Joan, she would still sound like her and I would still sound like me. Mm -hmm. You know, and you just need a read that's like easy and that works <laughs> when you're at work. So, um, yeah, and like I said, I don't, I don't profile Kane anymore. You know, maybe if I had a different job, I would. It would be nice. But um, it's also nice to like have time to have a life and do things. <laughs> do things that are not read making. Mm -hmm. Casey, do you have a favorite orchestral piece that you could share about? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know that I have a favorite piece. The funny thing about playing in the orchestra is it's different every time. You, you have different conductors come in and it can be very different. And uh, it's different depending on what orchestra you're playing with and that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, and it, you almost don't know when it's gonna happen, but I think that special time when like everybody's in that flow zone in the concert and you're just in the music, you're not thinking about anything else and you can hear everything and you're interacting, that's really what I love to do. And, um, you know, some pieces, maybe that's easier than others. I mean, I'm lucky I'm the principal now. I get to play the big solos or whatever. Um, and I get to play concertos and stuff. And that's great. Um, but I, but really, like, being in a concert with Flo, that's really where it's at. I mean, we have an amazing principal clarinet, um, George Kloss, you know. And I love playing with him. And we can just meld and make one sound. Um, that's what it's about. I mean, yeah, I like to play Stravinsky and Shostakovich and Mendelssohn and Mozart Piano Concerti. And Beethoven has the best wind section writing. And um, there's a lot of great stuff out there, for sure. And hopefully the conductor doesn't get in the way. <laughs> Tell me about a memorable audition experience. Yeah, I mean, that question's funny, too, because, you know, being a human with a human brain, I think most of us jump immediately to, like, our disaster audition. <laughs> I don't know if you do, Julie, but, yeah, um. I mean, I think, you know, it's just easier to remember those things, but the reality is we play so many things that we play great, right? So, um, Actually, one of the things that I have my students do, especially before auditions, is to have a highlight reel of times that you do well for auditions and remembering what that felt like. Because it is easier to remember the, mm -hmm. the, the one terrible audition, right? Um, I remember, yeah, I mean, when I had won the 
Auckland Philharmonia trial, I was in the grocery store and uh, Wendy called me and I like yelled and jumped up and down in the grocery store. So <laughs> I, I remember that, that was on like my highlight reel. Yeah. I remember yeah. winning um, Toledo Symphony. Um, I had my like lucky audition dress on and I can remember, <laughs> the, you know, nice black and white. And um, I remember where we were and all that. Um, so yeah, um, I've been lucky. I've been lucky a lot of times, so. We touched on this a little bit in the beginning. Um, have you experienced any music related injuries? Um, not in a long time, but in my undergrad, I was way over practicing. <laughs> I was way over practicing and I was like actively ignoring that fact um, because I was, even though I was an undergrad and DMA students usually win Chicago Civic, I just got it in my brain that I was like, I was gonna win Chicago Civic. I was gonna win it, you know? So I was just practicing way over, way over practicing. And um, I ended up doing nerve damage to both my forearms and I had to take um, quite a number of weeks off and go to physical therapy and stuff. You know, actually that was, in a way it was really lucky because it forced me to learn some lessons that I might not have come to on my own. Um, I took two years, probably longer than two years of private Alexander technique lessons. And I think, you know, a lot of conservatories now have Alexander Technique faculty, but I think that is super important. Um, it's learning how to play without overusing any muscle tension or um, any overusing any force. So that really retrained me how to sit with the bassoon, how to play. Um, so actually I could practice that many hours but I had taken the force away from it. So I had kind of taken the violence away from my arms. Um, and honestly, it takes a lot of the mental violence out of it too. Um, you know, it, we, we think that it's two systems and it's, it's not necessarily. <laughs> um, so I would recommend that to anyone who's a music student for sure. And again, it's a long-term practice. Um, it's not an overnight fix, um, but it is. Um, I actually went to that audition and was so obsessed with winning it and I was super prepared. Like I was ready to play awesome. You know, I had practiced a lot, right? Um, and I had never really had performance anxiety problems ever. I was really lucky in that way, maybe because I was like doing piano recitals in the mall when I was a little kid. Um, but I sat down to play at Civic and it was like, a complete explosion like I couldn't play at all it was terrible and unfortunately it's a recorded audition so the panel won't even usually if you really bomb it um the panel after they give you a chance they'll they'll say thank you to like let you out of your misery right <laughs> but they like I had to play through the whole thing <laughs> it was terrible um so uh after that, I, I came home and I was like, okay, that's it. I cannot do that. That was bad. <laughs> we have to fix that. So I went to the music library. I checked out every single book about uh, performance anxiety. Sibley Library is one of the biggest music libraries in the world. And they've got like a whole shelf or they did then. There's probably more now. Um, you know, back then there actually wasn't a lot of music specific research like there is now. Um, a lot of musicians were reading like golf books um, or like archery books. It's a lot of these accuracy sports, right? And now there's a lot of music specific stuff that you can find, which is really great. Um, but at the time it was, it was like um, Don Green's golf book and um, here's, here's a good one. You know, here's my golf book. Every shot must have a purpose. That sounds like music, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, and um, I found um, there was a Zen book there and um, that was where I really realized, okay, this is gonna, for me, that was what was gonna do it. So I started practicing um, Zen meditation, which helped a lot too. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and for everyone watching, Casey's joining on Sunday, February 28th um, at 7 Central Standard Time, 8 o'clock Ohio time, uh, to talk more about just um, these mindful modalities. And um, I'm just so excited to, to hear more about your, your work, Casey. Yeah, I mean, um, if you'd like to join us on the Zoom, and I hope you all do, um, I'm going to walk us through a really quick um, like mindfulness check-in that you can use for anything. Um, it doesn't have to be a music-related thing. I'll, I'll probably finish it off with a bit of a musical thing. Um, I think one of the things that's most important about it is you kind of need those mindfulness skills in, a, in your daily normal life, in your normal practice life, because if you just try at the audition to not be nervous or to have superhuman focus, if it's not part of what you're already doing, it's never going to work when you're now under pressure. <laughs> now you like really need it, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, again, it's these things kind of aren't quick fix kind of things, um, but they're really easy to do. Anybody can do it. It's part of this human technology that humans have had for thousands of years and um, it really works. So um, hopefully you can join us for that. Hmm. Yeah, and um, really looking forward to that. And what are important skills learned through music that apply to everyday life? Um, you know, I think there's, a lot of really great skills from music that carry over. Um, my dad for work is actually a headhunter and he says all the time he actually hires a lot of people with music degrees. Um, being able to be a musician, you're working on a project for long term. And you know, we as soon as we play it, as soon as it's out of the instrument, it's gone, right? <laughs> you don't have something that you can hold up and be like, I made this, you know? So you really learn to work on your own, to see the value of practicing and perseverance through all of that. That's super important no matter what you do. Um, if you're a freelancer, you have to learn business skills, you're marketing yourself, you have a lot of good accounting to keep your books, you have to be really organized to teach, you have to be able to speak clearly and uh, be understood to teach. Um, all those things are really important. I mean, when you're playing the orchestra, you're just getting along with everybody, you're melding with everybody, nobody's right, you know, you're all just making it work. Um, that's gonna work for you no matter what. Um, classical music has that amazing attention to detail, especially when you're talking about doing auditions. So you can do any kind of detail work. I think a lot of musicians are really good at scientific stuff or computer programming. I mean, there's so many directions that you could take it in. Mm. Is there any advice that you can share for musicians just starting out? Um, flicking. <laughs> if you're a bassoonist. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, um, you know, practice. <laughs> what more can you say? Um, it, my teacher, Will Roberts, and this is at a point where I'm, you know, I'm applying for professional jobs. I've already had a few gigs. And he used to say, it's not rocket science, you know. And I'd be like, well, how do you do that? And he would just say, you go to the practice room and you don't leave until you figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes we like to make it more complicated than that, but if you can really figure out how to focus your practicing, get the most amount done in the shortest amount of time, you know, you want to be really focused when you're practicing and then take a really clear break when you're on break, be done with it, put it away, don't ruminate on it and chew the fat. Mm -hmm. So you want to be really gentle with yourself when you're practicing and then, but you also have to have um, the perseverance to like go back and practice more um, during maybe at a different time or the next day. Hmm. Casey, who do you think I should interview next? Hmm. Well, how about um, Tom Fleming? He was my colleague in high school at North Carolina School of the Arts. And he's kind of new on the scene because he just won the second bassoon job in Dallas Symphony. So I think he would be great. Wonderful. I'll have to that's tell cool. him I'm nominated. Yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> I'll be like, sorry, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> 
Casey, thank you so much for sharing this interview. It's been wonderful getting a glimpse into your life and career as a professional musician. Thank you so much, Julie. It was a lot of fun. It's great to see you. For everyone tuning in, keep an eye out for new videos with great bassoon guests every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. On the Let's Link project, every guest interviewed here is hosting a free online Zoom panel discussion the following Sunday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, and you can register for this on the Music Link website. Please like, comment, and share any questions or feedback in the section below, and subscribe to this channel for new videos every week. Check out the Music Link Instagram and Facebook pages for more information too. The Music Link is a New Zealand-based online platform for people to share, learn, and connect. Thank you for watching and I'll see y'all in the next video.